Hello, I'm Kathleen Benoit, host of well, uh, Living Well in Montana. That's a program that's made possible by Living Independently for Today and Tomorrow, Lyft. Lyft is a nonprofit organization headquartered in Billings and serving Montanans living with disabilities in an 18 county portion of South Central Montana. It's a, it's a big area. My guest today is June Hammerson. She is the chair of the Statewide Independent Living Council and has devoted her life to enhancing the lives of Montanans and other, others living with disabilities. We have a lot to talk about. We are doing this Zoom session and I want to welcome you, June, so much. Um, you have you have done a lot with your life and I, I can't wait to really get into it. But before that, why don't you talk a little bit about Silk and um, what its purpose in the state of Montana is. Thank you for having me. Um, the Statewide Independent Living Council or the acronym is called SILK. Um, we are mandated under federal regulations uh, to provide um, information and assistance for the provision of independent living services in Montana. Um, so it is a governor's appointed council and uh, we write a three year state plan and with that, with that process, we partner with the Centers for Independent Living, of which Lyft is one of those centers in the state of Montana. We have four centers in Montana, Great Falls, Missoula, Helena, and, and Lyft. Um, and what the state plan does is outlines um, the types of services, the gaps in services, um, maybe populations that aren't being served, um, those types of things and put them, um, set out goals um, and milestones that we need to meet to achieve some of the issues that arise for the centers as they provide services. So we're really a partner with the, the Centers for Independent Living um, and uh, individuals um, comprise a variety of things under federal mandate. We have to have a... Uh, uh, representative from the mm. centers and Carlos from Lyft is that director representative on the SOAP. We need to have 51% of our council has to be people with disabilities. Um, and so it's set forward in federal regulations in regard to what we um, need to look like. And then we take it on at the state level in regard to uh, writing our own plan. So it's applicable to Montanans. Now there's four um, centers for independent living in the state of Montana. Are, are, are they, do they vary from each other or do they all follow the same protocol? Is one different from maybe what's going on with Lyft and Billings? There, each center is its own private nonprofit organization. So every center has its own board of directors. Um, and of course, mm -hmm. with Montana's geographical makeup, um, the center in Missoula is going to look quite a bit different than the, the center in Billings um, because the, the, the just the geographical area that they cover is so significantly different. But under federal regulations, uh, the centers provide some core services. Each center mm -hmm. is required to provide information and referral. Um, each center is required to provide independent living skills training. And so I'm sure that you all have talked about the independent living specialists that um, are at Lyft. And so yes. each, each center has um, independent living specialists, peer support, uh, one of the main things in regard to disability acceptance and disability awareness is finding that support of peers, people with either similar disabilities or just the disability community as a whole. And so peer support is one of, again, one of those core services. Mm -hmm. And then transition. Um, transition means lots of things, but um, in relation to independent living, it's transition of youth from high school to the adult world or the transition 
of an individual that may be in a nursing home that wishes mm -hmm. to go back to community living, maybe in their own home after rehabilitation or whatever. And that is also a transition process. So each of the centers has core services, how they provide those services, um, uh, additional grants that they might write, um, those types of things are all driven by the local community and the local board of directors. June, is it challenging given the ge geography of the state of Montana and so many small rural communities that don't have broadband, they don't have access to internet, they do people know about what all these services that are available, like, are, are you finding, it, is that a challenge to reach as far as you can to Montanans living with disabilities that may not have any idea that these wonderful services are available? Well, I, and I think that's a great point because especially in Eastern Montana, um, I've lived in Miles City in Glasgow, and so mm -hmm. I've lived out there in the world that, um, you know, we always figured everybody, Helena and West didn't even know we existed in Eastern Montana. So the nice thing about you're off giving us this opportunity to talk about the 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 silk is that um, bringing a voice for your part of the state in Eastern Montana to the silk um, because being able to identify those services, getting the word out, how's the best way to do that? How do we make sure, um, in, and I know that Lyft has done a great job in regard to trying to reach people in those most rural areas to, to let them know the services that are available to them. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, and that's the thing is we need that voice. We need the voice of Billings and East of Billings on this council. Um, because sometimes um, it's not just uh, enough to to want to be heard. We we also want you to come to the table and to be a partner in some of those solutions. Because that's a huge huge issue. Is how do we how do we actually reach the folks that need the service? You mentioned earlier that um, the uh, uh, part of the requirement is that um, the participants themselves who work for Silk um, are, have a disability. Some of them do. And I, I read about your situation and would you be comfortable talking about your disability? Oh, oh certainly. I, um, I'm congenitally disabled. So essentially I was born with a visual impairment. Um, and um, so I've gone through the stages of acceptance for as it relates to disability. Um, and of course, the teen years are the hardest years, and um, particularly as you're accepting a disability um, with raging hormones. Um, but <laughs> uh, so, so my lifespan has been to make it through that uh, acceptance process, and then to um, it, with lots of supports. Um, and there's some been some peer support in my life that. Um, got me to a place of finishing my education and such. And so now I take serious the whole concept of paying, paying it forward. Um, I was misdiagnosed for the first 30 years of my life. And um, wow. when that happened, then they give you treatments for the different part of the eye than, than what's really affected. So um, my, my vision loss has been... Um, kind of continual as I age. Uh, and uh, I lost the one eye about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And so we're down to counting fingers at about 18 inches in one eye. But, um, you know, I, I've always, I was very blessed with a childhood, a very supportive family. Um, and, and that just continues to this day. And, uh, but but what the challenge is, is later onset of disability. Um, once you have your concept of self already established, mm -hmm. the disability comes along. Um, sometimes that acceptance process is just takes a little longer, but um, that's why the peer support approach of the independent living centers is so important because people want to know that they're not alone. 
they're not alone in their journey of disability or disability acceptance. And so that's a real asset of the independent living centers and why I got involved in independent living, I shouldn't say so long ago, but back in the 80s. So. But that's not too long ago. <laughs> um, well, I've read a little bit of your biography and uh, it sounded like um, there were um, educators who didn't recognize what was going on with you and basically told your parents that you just weren't going to make it in, in oh, school. <laughs> oh, that, that, well, you know, and some of that comes from, a, I can honestly call myself an ornery teenager um, <laughs> because I, uh, I'll go back to first grade. I really didn't know anything was wrong with me till I got the public school system because I was just, I was a farm girl and I did everything that you did on the farm. And then I got to public uh -huh. school and then everybody went, Oh, Oh, you've got some problems. Um, but it, it, again, I'm old enough that the uh, individual education act didn't even exist. Special education didn't even exist. Um, and so uh, what we take for granted today, accommodations in the schools and, and all of the types of things, whether it's more time on tests and those types of things, um, alternatives to learning weren't even discussed. And so um, with my vision, um, once I started getting negative feedback that I wasn't doing well, then I quit trying. Um, and, and then I was just ornery about it. Um, but so in high school, they give you test to see what your potential is. And so many of my friends were going to college um, and the guidance counselor yeah. um, told my folks that, you know, keep up my farming skills because I really had no potential. So, um, but my parents um, were advocates before advocates were the click word um, and, and that wasn't acceptable to them. So, um, I was required to go to one year of college, um, and uh, uh, I did. I got connected with vocational rehabilitation, um, and uh, I met a man who had lost his vision due to a brain tumor. He was my counselor, and um, he was is the one of the heroes in my life because he said either you do something for yourself or you know. Nobody that was else. my next question. Is, <laughs> is, did you have a hero? <laughs> I, did. I did. His name was Mike Connor. Um, and um, he, um, like I say, I think basically he just held me accountable. He was, hmm. you know, there wasn't any pity. I was socially promoted, I believe, um, in, in the school system because nobody knew quite what to do with visual impairment and honoring us together. Right. Um, and so, um, but <laughs> he came to my life and um, uh, the day that I got my bachelor's in social work, you know, he was there um, at the party. And uh, wow. after I got my master's in education, um, he had uh, passed on because of his brain tumor. But um, he probably was there because I, you know, had proved everybody a little bit wrong in regard to those, wow. <laughs> in regard to those issues. So, well, you know, and I am i can't help but make the connection now between being a, a headstrong teenager and learning to cope with a disability. Uh -huh. um, and now you have, uh, I wanted to touch it a little bit on the youth transition programs mm -hmm. that you uh, have been working with for 16 years. Yeah, well, actually, um, since the late 90s, and, and this is a good example of what the State Independent Living Council can do. I learned of, um, there was an opportunity on a national level uh, for um, people to get trained on how to start a youth leadership forum. And um, at the time I was part of the Silk and I took it to the Silk and said, so how about we start talking about youth programs more? And so I did attend that national training and that was in the fall of 1998. And um, I came back and uh, the State Independent Living Council uh, set up a committee and we formulated a beginning budget. Um, and uh, the SOAP decided that it didn't want to take on the Youth Leadership Forum as a project at that time. But oh, it, okay. 
so we started out independently. We started uh, with the support of MSU Billings. Um, and that's where the first ones were held. And then um, we became a program of the Independent Living Center out of Great Falls, North Central Independent Living Services. Our first youth leadership forum was in um, 2000. And I'm happy to say that next month, uh, what is it, the 21st Youth Leadership Forum will take place. So we've wow. had 20 years. Um, it's a program based on um, the idea that uh, the staff are people with disabilities, the youth are youth with disabilities, um, the history and culture of disabilities is, is brought forward so people can understand that there's pride in who we are as a community, um, no more shame game, um, we're okay mm -hmm. being who we are. Um, and uh, what those youth have uh, come out of there, um, I just, I get goosebumps even thinking about the stories. If, if some of those youth were here now and telling you their stories of how that program has changed their lives, yes. those five days, um, you'd be in tears with me because those stories are just um, amazing. And I think it's that they are in the environment where everybody's fully accepted just for who they are. Um, and yet they share um, that common um, label, if you will, of having a disability. So, um, and we talk about things like being the honorary teenager that really doesn't get you anywhere. <laughs> If you are just joining us, I'm Kathleen Benoit, host of Living Well in Montana, and I'm talking with June Hammerson, who is the chair of the SILC, which is Statewide Independent Living Council. Council? Yes. yes. Um, you know, and I, I want you to define uh, youth transition for some of our viewers, because it's, as I understand, it's um, working with young people going in, maybe into high school or going into college or getting a job or becoming an adult. And it's, there's a lot of, of challenge there. Well, in, in the whole transition, while you're still in the public school system, um, you have access to, um, you know, accommodations and individual education plans and those types of things. And the services are provided. Well, when you turn 18 or get out of school, the world turns on a dime because <laughs> you be, you're no longer covered by IDEA and people aren't setting things up for you, meetings or, um, you know, accessible options, those types of things. When you become 18, you're an adult and you <laughs> or get out of school and um, you're now covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. But it's no longer just my right to receive services. It's your responsibility to request those services. You have to, and that's where the training programs for youth come into play. You need to know that you've got to know what your disability is. You need to define it. You need to know uh, what accommodations you need. And so the responsibility becomes yours. So we need to prepare young people for um, not having all of that information um, in hand. I, I often tell you, you need to define your disability because if you don't, society will. So <laughs> what are you going to be happier with? Are you going to be happier with defining yourself or letting mm -hmm. society do it? And you, most people like to define themselves. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I, I'm sorry I interrupted. It was a, it was a good statement. Do you, by chance, have a, an idea of the percentage of uh, children or, or students in Montana that are um, have, have a disability? You know, I don't have current numbers on that. Um, at the, the last numbers that I saw were at about 18% of the youth in Montana oh. high schools had a disability. Now, when we talk disability, we're talking everything from physical disabilities through cognitive impairments. Yes. So yes. yeah. 
the, the, the hidden ones that people don't recognize right. because they, they're not in a wheelchair or they're not you know um in a situation where you can actually see that they have a disability right but the, and those kind of topic areas, um, uh, you know, uh, there you've got parents and such in your ve- viewing um, area that they probably have some great ideas or understand some needs that young people have. Or mm-hmm. um, and those are the people that we'd like to have at the table. We'd like to have their voice at the table to let us know. Um, and so that's why if they would apply to be become part of the team of the Statewide Independent Living Council, it would greatly help us build that plan for maybe unmet needs or underserved individuals. And so that's that's really the Statewide Independent Living Council. Um, you know, we, we can do a lot of things for a lot of people. We just need um, people that want to volunteer, bring their ideas and help us build it. Thank you. What, what is the biggest challenge in um, the uh, SILK program that, that you hope to make a change? Well, currently, our biggest challenge is membership. I think that everyone is really busy um, and um, they want to make sure that what they're going to be a part of is going to impact people's lives. And so I think that... Um, you know, if, if we can get people to realize that um, an idea of a, uh, any kind of idea that they might have of something, how, they might have ideas on how we reach more people in defining services. Um, and those are the types of ideas that I know people have out there and we need to hear from them. Um, you know, we we have a number of things going on with, uh, you know, the state plan and what we want to do. We try to make sure that we're geographically balanced. Um, and so that's that's, again, one of our challenges is um, how do we how do we get everybody's voice? Um, and, and this is an opportunity for people east of Helena to have their voice and bring it to the table. I know that um, you are also seeking um, people who might be interested in joining Silk. Uh-huh. And um, I, I, I have lost my screen, so I can't see if um, we have a link for that application process, because that is a, a gubernatorial appointment. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yes it is. Yes. And it's a, a link online, and so people can um, uh, apply online. And uh, uh, again, it's a three-year appointment um, and uh, people receive, you know, needless to say, all the expenses are paid after you travel to Helena for the meeting or whatever. Or thanks to 2020, we've all learned how to connect virtually. (laughs) So so that is an accommodation that's totally available now. Um, And and then uh, individuals receive an honorarium for the days of the meeting of the Silk. We do meet four times a year um, in person or or virtually. Um, And we have a variety of committees. Um, We uh, for instance the bylaws or the you know and we create ad hoc committees as things come forward. For instance, like I was talking about the Youth Leadership Forum when we first Mm -hmm. started, uh, we built an ad hoc committee to to build a structure or framework of what a budget for that would look like. So, you know, and then handed it off. And so there's lots of projects out there that that we can begin um, and we can follow through with and have them ourselves. We create, helped advocate for um, a transportation coordinator for the state of Montana. Mm-hmm. Uh, transportation is a huge issue for people with disabilities. Um, but within DPHHS, we advocated for, and um, there is a transportation coordinator that can be contacted by anybody across the state that is having trouble with public transportation. No, just another issue, just another example of an issue that we've tackled. June, we are just about out of time. Is there anything else you would like to add to, to the SILK function and the programs they offer or anything else you just want to add? I, I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to share our, our request 
for people to apply for a membership. Um, we, we want the voice of the people in your listening area um, and uh, working the statewide independent living council again works in partnership with centers like living independently for today and tomorrow and we'd sure like to hear have your voice at the table. June, thank you so much. This thank you. Wonderful. I hope you come back. Oh, we'll do this again. So Okay. I've Sounds been speaking good. with June Hemerson, who is the uh, chair of the Silk Program. And I'm Kathleen Benoit. This has been Living Well in Montana. And we'll see you again. Thanks for joining us.